verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he, John the Baptist, is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So let's just pause here and try and understand who this guy is, John the Baptist. Uh, what are some things that, is, that stick out to you kind of immediately just reading this portrait? Jesse? He eats, bugs. he eats bugs. Yeah, that's probably the most wild thing for sure. Anything else? <laughs> he seems to be homeless. Yeah, right. He's out in the wilderness. Um, he's got some camel hair for clothes and a leather belt around his waist. Um, he's got an interesting message. Here, here's three things that I'll summarize. First about John the Baptist is he is a wilderness preacher. Um, it seems that he's kind of this rogue prophet type in the wilderness, and he doesn't seem to be in line with kind of the religious establishment of the day, which would operate usually in the temple, in the synagogue. Instead, he's out in the wilderness doing his own thing. So that's the first thing I think we need to see here. And kind of, kind of important is uh, a good reader of the Bible, especially the Israelites who Matthew's writing to, would see that he's in the wilderness and they would equate that with exile. So in a lot of ways, uh, whatever John the Baptist is doing is he's preaching from this place of exile, which a lot of Jews would resonate with. Secondly, he's heralding a strong message. Does anyone remember what his message was? What was he out there preaching? Three tips to have a good agricultural life? No? <laughs> okay, repent. That was part of it. Yeah. What was the second part? Right. So, and he said that by talking about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I would say those are the, kind of the two parts. You've, you've got this message of repent, and then the second part is because, it's related to the first, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So kind of just talking about those two things, um, repentance. Now repent, uh, we're going to actually spend a whole sermon at D now talking about that word repentance and that idea of repentance, so I won't get too deep into what that means here, but basically this was a term calling for people to turn their life around. Um, it was a, a call to shift one way of living to a different type of living. And that's what John is calling them to. He's saying, you need to turn your life around. Whatever direction you're headed right now needs to turn, and it needs to go in a different direction. And wherever that direction is, it's having to be in line with the second part, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, kingdom of heaven is synonymous with, with what other gospel accounts call the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew uses kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. Um, does anyone in here like have a close like Jewish friend or a Jewish friend or family member? Okay. Do you know what they, what they call God? Or do they use a different name for God? They're very, part so this is part of it. They, they're very particular about using that name. And they don't like to use that name kind of, this is the only phrase I'm thinking of, willy-nilly. They don't like to just throw God's name around. A lot of times you'll hear them say Hashem, which is the name. And this was to preserve the sanctity of saying God's name without saying God's name. To refer to God without saying God's name. They would just say the name. That's what Hashem means. And so one theory of why Matthew uses kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God is because he's preserving God's name. He doesn't want to just use this, the, the term God, quote, willy-nilly. That's um, the exact reason. So, but he's saying the kingdom of heaven, which was uh, symbolically kind of a metaphor for God's space, God's realm, his rule and his reign. So his lordship. So he's saying that God and his very presence is coming to earth. His lordship is coming to earth. It's kind of breaking through into 
the world. And it's because of that they need to acknowledge that and turn towards that. So if you just kind of package this together, this is what John the Baptist is screaming about in the wilderness. He's saying uh, the realm of the rule and the reign of God, God's lordship is coming to earth. And because of this happening, people need to return to God and redirect their way of life. This is what he is screaming about in the wilderness. Um, Third thing here um, is he's fulfilling a foretold role. Okay, so he's a wilderness preacher. He's heralding this strong message. And thirdly, he's fulfilling a foretold role. Matthew narrates that John is fulfilling something that was pointed at in the Old Testament through a prophet named Isaiah. And Isaiah basically says, someone's coming to make straight the paths of the Lord. And um, what do you think that means? Make straight the paths. Again, it's weird phrasing. We don't talk like that. But we just also assume that we know what that means. Um, Basically, traveling in the ancient world, like, you know, when we travel, like we drove to the zoo today. It was like two hours away, and it was just get in the car, we go. Now, traveling is a little different with three toddlers in a van and things like that. There is a portable potty, which I won't get too um, detailed on how that works, but maybe some illegal activity in the car, getting, you know, people unbuckled. So you don't have to stop every five minutes. Anyway, so traveling's a little bit difficult with a van and small children, but it's much easier today than it was back then. Traveling was a very dangerous thing back in the ancient world. And oftentimes before a king would travel, he would send out his servants to kind of like travel that road first, make sure there weren't bandits, make sure there weren't, um, you know, any debris or anything blocking the path. So this would be like a forerunner, someone who would go first to make sure the path was clear for the king to come and then journey. And that's who John the Baptist is. He is this forerunner. He's making the path straight for Jesus who's coming behind him. And Isaiah prophesied about one that would be that for the coming Messiah. And so Matthew is telling us that's John the Baptist. Okay? Um, Another thing, though, if you're just kind of like reading the story, right, and you're just kind of browsing this, this passage... Verse 4, this last verse, is really interesting, right? I mean, it's like, okay, there's this dude in the desert, he's preaching this message, and it's almost like Matthew pauses and says, now, just so you know, (laughs) he wears camel hair, a leather belt, and eats locusts and honey. Like, that is interesting. I think that should stop us and pause us. Like, why in the world did Matthew tell us that, right? It kind of seems like this unnecessary detail. Did we need to know this? So what's really interesting about how the Bible tells stories is it often um, leaves out physical descriptions of its characters. We don't know a lot about what people looked like in the Bible, but when the Bible does tell us what people look like, it's actually really, really important. It tells us something about the person's character, their function, their destiny. It usually has a heavier meaning than just knowing that, say, Saul was a tall guy right? That's one of the physical descriptions you see in the Bible, that Saul was a tall guy. And, the, and the, the, the biblical authors are trying to tell you something about how he was sized up. He appeared to be a quote-unquote leader to the people and things like that. Um, but here, again, the Bible is telling us a physical description about John the Baptist, and this is more than just giving us a basic fact about John the Baptist. Why do we think this is here? What, what are some theories? Why do you think this physical description is here. What does that make you do or think? Adam. Right. Maybe it's like, hey, this is a crazy guy in the wilderness kind of thing. <laughs> and that's what the description could be? Okay, I get that. Anything else? Okay, I think those are good theories. Jesse? Hey, that's, that's really good. So, um, because, you know, this was a practice in, uh, in the ancient times. These ancient, or these preachers would go out, and they would start, you know, rattling off this teaching. 
But usually they would do these in the cities because that's where they would receive money because people would usually throw money at these street preachers in the city. The fact that John the Baptist is doing this in the wilderness is like, to Jesse's point, he's, he's not looking for money. He's not looking for notoriety. He's not looking for all these things. So that's really good. Another thing that we can do when you're looking at these odd details in this story, okay, is look up where else these odd details are in the Bible, okay? So like a good question would be like, do we ever see anyone else in the Bible described this way? Do we ever see anyone else in the Bible described with a hair garment and a leather belt around his waist? And we do. The only other person in the Bible that is said to have a leather belt around his waist and a hair garment is this guy named Elijah, who was a super cool dude. This is a depiction of camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, I guess. But uh, the prophet Elijah, if you took our king study a while back, he was a really cool guy. Um, uh, rabbis say is, uh, that he's a prophet with chutzpah. You ever heard chutzpah? Like, you know, energy, fire. No? I thought that's made its way around. Like, chutzpah. You got real chutzpah, kid. No? Nobody? Okay. I'm just, um, I don't know what 90s movie I watched to pick that up. Um, but this is uh, a description of Elijah and, and from 2 Kings. There's this one king that asked him, what sort of man came up to meet you and speak those words to you? They replied, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. He said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. So again, this is an interesting detail that's put in the story of Kings to talk about how Elijah was this guy with a leather belt and a hairy kind of garment. And Matthew inserts that into the story of describing John the Baptist. Why do you think he does that? Maybe, possibly, to compare what John the Baptist is doing to what Elijah did, right? So he's trying to draw some similarities, maybe some differences. Um, But the fact is, he wants us to think of John the Baptist as some sort of Elijah-like character, some sort of prophet like Elijah, okay? Um, And if we had time, I would probably just send us into small groups, and we would all look up stories on Elijah and try and draw some comparisons. I think that would be fun and cool, but maybe you guys wouldn't. But I'll give you my idea here. One of the key things is, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet named Malachi. It's the last book in our English Old Testament. And Malachi says, uh, the day of the Lord is coming. And this was a day when God would put the world back to rights. He would judge Israel. He would restore Israel in that judgment um, and then rule his world completely. That was called the day of the Lord. There's actually a really good Bible project video on the day of the Lord, if you want to dive deeper this week. But one of the things Malachi says about the day of the Lord is that before it comes, someone like Elijah will come before that day comes. And so Matthew picks up on that, and what he's saying is John the Baptist is this Elijah-like character that's bringing about the day of the Lord. In other words, John the Baptist is this Elijah-like figure who is preparing the way for the day of the Lord. When the kingdom comes, all the, the rule and reign of God comes, and Jesus is bringing about that day. So Matthew is connecting Jesus once again to the story of Israel, and he's also connecting John to important parts of that story as well. So you'll often, maybe you have this, you've had this before, but when you're reading the gospel accounts, it's like, what's the big deal about this John the Baptist guy? Sometimes I'm like, ah, why in the world are we spending so much attention on this dude? Um, But I think it's because of this, because it's a critical part of understanding the story, okay? So we have a lot more things to go, which kind of jump along here. So that's John the Baptist. It's a good portrait of who he is. Let's continue. So then people from... Jerusalem, that's the city, all Judea, the surrounding area, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him. They were leaving the cities to go to this wilderness preacher guy. Again, it's almost like all the people of Israel going back into exile. Okay, there's this kind of this feel to it. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. 
So on the face of everything, John is pretty popular. And it says um, all of these people were going out to him. And what are they going to see John about? What are they going to do? What is it? To get baptized. And uh, that's a word that should stick out to you, right? We're Lake Norman Baptist Church. That's where this comes from. It's from the word baptize in the Bible. Did you ever, it, it might be one of those things, though, that you actually didn't connect. You're afraid to admit it right now, but maybe someone just had a light bulb moment. It's like that one time I was driving by the Chick-fil-A sign and I finally saw that the C was a chicken. Do you guys know that? (laughs) I didn't know what it was. I was just like a C. It was a weird cursive C. And then one day I was like, wait, there's a beak. Oh my goodness, there's a thing. And it was a chicken. It just happened. (laughs) Yeah, it was pretty bad. Anyway, um, so we should be familiar with this word, right? Baptized. What does that word mean? Anybody? That's a good description. That's actually what the word means. It's immerse. Okay? This is from the Greek word baptizo. And instead of actually translating it in English, we've actually just said, yeah, we're just going to keep that word in English. So we don't actually translate it immerse. We just create, created a new word in English called baptized. And... Uh, so that's, that's what that means. But so that's what, that's what John was doing. He was taking these people and immersing them in the river and then bringing up them up out of the river. And this was tied to them confessing their sins. Now, in Dina, we're also going to devote a whole sermon to baptism. So I won't go super into it here. But this was a ritual, an embodied ritual, to show a transfer of allegiance or a new loyalty. Um, And so what these people were doing is they were responding to John's message for repentance. John was saying, we got to change our way of life, and the way that they symbolized that they were going to respond to that and accept that was they would be immersed to die to one way of life and be raised to walk in a different way of life. That's what this ritual was. This is the first time we see the ritual in the Bible. There's a lot of like debate where it came from and what it actually meant, but um, that's what John's using it for here, okay? Um, And this is causing a lot of stir. This is starting to really get out of hand, uh, especially for uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what what I will call the religious elites. Um, And what we see next is they're about to check out John and see what that's all about. Oh, that was the question. Verse 7, when he saw many, this is John the Baptist, sees many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Anyone ever greeted you that way? (laughs) Well, I mean, uh, right, Jesus will greet them in the same way. Yeah, that's going to become their new kind of, um, I guess that's who we are now. Um, does anyone know where that, um, that image comes from? Like, snakes are bad. Snakes are bad in the Bible? <laughs> um, there's one theory that I think is interesting, and this is just a fun fact. Um, but uh, vipers, when they're born, the babies actually eat their mothers. So part... <laughs> So part of what maybe this imagery is, it's like, oh, you brood of vipers, you newborn vipers, you're eating the, the one who, who gave birth to you. Yeah, so it's an interesting, it's a very pointed insult. That may be what it means, it may not, but the imagery is kind of there because they're turning their back on the God who made them and created them. Anyway, so brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance, with this change of life. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So let's just kind of take this one step at a time. But these religious elites show up and John has a pretty harsh message for them. He, he's pretty direct. 
He's not, you know, sugarcoating anything for them. He's pretty harsh with his message. Um, and what, what is his beef here? Well, it seems to be that they are taking the fact that they're called children of Abraham. They're taking that privilege, and they're not actually living up to that identity. Instead of actually living like God wants his children to live, they're just boasting in that identity and then actually not producing fruit or a way of life that's reflective of that. So they, they've misunderstood why God has chosen them as a people. Uh, God didn't choose Israel because they were awesome for anything inside of them. God chose them because he chose them. That's what he wanted to do. And they got all high and mighty about it. And his kind of dig at them was like, you think you're so good? Like, God could make these stones his children if he really wanted to. Like, that's the qualifications. Just be a stone. That's how much qualification you need to be a child of God. And yet, you are all high and mighty about this. And secondly, it seems that they misunderstood their role. The fact that God chose them as his people meant that he wanted to do something in and through them. He wanted to be a blessing to them to make them into people that could bless others. Stretches all the way back to Abraham. That's what he wanted to do with these people. He was going to bless Abraham and his family and his descendants so that he could bless the whole world. And they've seemingly misunderstood this. And they've turned in on themselves and made it all about themselves. So, um, John says that there's consequences for this type of living this type of religious game that they're playing and its destructive consequences. He says, it will be destructive for you in your life. Um, He uses this imagery of a tree getting cut down and being thrown into the fire. And uh, we'll say more about that as well. And he continues. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I, John, am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand. He's using kind of this metaphor of how they would harvest. They would have this, this shovel in his hand, and he would clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the leftovers, the chaff... Uh, He will burn with fire that never goes out. Again, there's a lot of stuff we could say here, but some basic things we need to see. Again, John is the forerunner pointing to someone that's coming after him. That's Jesus. John says, I'm doing this, but there's someone coming after me that's the real deal. I baptize with water. This guy is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I, I wish we could go into what all of that is saying to them, but um, another thing we see is that he warns of Jesus' judgment. He says he's coming to gather his wheat or his people, and uh, he's going to burn the chaff, which seemingly is not his people. And um, I think that's tough to say out loud, honestly. I wish John didn't say that. I wish we didn't have to talk about Jesus burning people. I don't. I don't think that's very kind. I don't think that's very nice. I wish Jesus would give that chaff another chance. Honestly. And I think uh, if we're honest with ourselves in here, that, that hits us a little square in the chest. Like, really? That's some serious business here that we're talking about. And um, I think... One of the, the teachings that we'll have to zero in at some time uh, throughout this series, and me and Tucker were talking about this a little bit uh, yesterday, we're going to probably just spend a night talking about this fire imagery and what John and Jesus are talking about with the fire imagery and later um, throughout Matthew what he talks about with the hell of fire and all of this. So we'll, we'll try to spend a more dedicated time on that, but there's two things I want to say right now. First, John the Baptist is talking to religious elites here. He is talking to the people that think they have it all together, that think that they are God's chosen, and they are sitting pretty in life. That's who he's talking to. 
In a, real, in, a, in a real sense, I think this is meant to be a sharp rebuke to them in particular. Because sometimes it's the most religious people that are dull to messages from God. It's, we often use religion to hide behind what we actually want in life. And so what we see in Scripture is usually the, the sharpest messages are given to the most religious of people. And so we got, we got to make sure we understand that and, and see that here. Second thing we have to realize that though it unsettles us, though it, it makes us uneasy, this is good. As much as it bucks up against our ideas of niceness and superficial love, it is good that King Jesus is a king that will judge. Okay? It's good that Jesus has that power and that authority and we need to make sure we hang on to that. Um, that. That Jesus will be so committed to protecting his people that he will cast out evil and wickedness from his world is a good thing. And the third thing we have to realize is it's good that Jesus is the judge because he's also the one that died for the people he judges. So Jesus is the one who is able to throw the first stone he is the one who is able to, um, to, to cast judgment on us. And he, he chose to love us first in our ungodliness and in our rebuke of him and in our constant wanting to do things our own way and to be rebellious. Like Jesus, Jesus is that loving king, but he's also serious about getting the evil influences out of his world, and we should be thankful for that. Um, so it reminds me from this, uh, of this quote from C.S. Lewis, who was read in Chronicles of Narnia. Read it? Anybody? Casey, have you read all of them? <laughs> the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is one of the famous ones. We actually just rewatched the three movies as a family on Disney+. Plus. It's sad. It's just sad. Anyway, um, so there's this quote. Um, Susan's talking to Mr. Beaver. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Beaver, if you don't know this book, this is really weird, but there's talking animals and stuff. Uh, Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion. That's kind of the Jesus figure throughout the book. The lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So it's just one of these great images of, um, you know, a lion isn't safe, but the fact in Narnia that he's a good lion is tying this kind of tension together. And I think it's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus is not a wimp. He is not a pushover, right? He's gentle and lowly, but he's also strong and courageous and mighty and victorious and the rightful judge. And um, I think we should let that tension bother us a little bit. We should let that confront us a little bit. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Now, we've gone kind of long, but I want to give kind of two pastoral words here for us as we kind of look at this passage and apply it to us today. Number one, the harshest, harshest message is often directed at the most religious. And if we're honest, that's, that's us. In this country, in this world, the people sitting in a church building on a Wednesday night are, are probably the most religious people in the world. And um, the harshest messages are often directed at those. We see this throughout the gospel accounts. Jesus is a kind, loving, compassionate person, but he, he's also direct and blunt with the religious elites. Um, Jesus does not like to play religious games and he has harsh words for people that do. And I think when you look throughout Scripture, it's really the religious people that are often on the receiving end of some of the sharpest words in Scripture. Um, if you look at the prophets, it's a great example. I mean, the prophets roast the religious elites over and over again, constantly. Uh, just read the, read the opening chapter of Isaiah today, or sometime. I mean, the... Isaiah is just roasting the religious elites. 
and there's a, there's a tone about it. And I think here's the important thing is sometimes we need that tone. We need to hear that tone of a sharp confrontation, of a harsh confronting our lives. Because if not, we don't confront ourselves very well. We don't. We're, we're not, you know, we give everybody else the harshest criticism and we save the most excuses for ourselves. That's just, you know, our, our tendency. Um, but sometimes we need to be shaken and we need to hear words like, you know, what good is it if you go to a worship service once a week to hear about Jesus if you look nothing like him? Some of us need to hear that. What good is it if you read your Bible every day, but it doesn't make you into a more loving, merciful, truthful person like Jesus? What good is it? This is much the tone of Isaiah. He's like, what good are your festivals? What good are your offerings and all these things if you forsake the widow and the orphan and you're not enacting justice in the world? What good are those things, these religious things you do, unless you're actually becoming the type of people you claim to be in God's people? So what good is it if we continue to just do religious games and yet we still bring chaos into the world with our lives through gossip, through excluding others, through not caring for others' needs or not caring that people feel left out or we still tell lies to protect our reputations or we're dishonest, we're unloving, we're unkind, all of these things. What good is it that we're in this room right now if when we're outside of this room, we're not more like Jesus and we're not being like Jesus? And I, I think we need that, that sharp rebuke at times. Um, and I still slip into this mindset, and I still, I'll still need this myself. You know? But I praise God, and I think we should too, that He lovingly gives us these piercing truths. And like a father guiding his children to say, this life, you're, li- you're, you're, you're missing it. But he's kind and he's gracious to redirect us. He's kind and, his, and he's gracious to say, return to me. Repent. And he gives us the opportunity day in and day out to turn again to him. His mercies are new every day. His forgiveness is overwhelming for you. His, and he's abundantly loving towards, towards you. So we need those interruptions at times. We need to be confronted in these things at times. Um, And secondly, the people of God are called to produce fruit, not privilege. Um, God has sought us in Christ. It's not anything in ourselves. By grace, by God's gift to us, we have been saved. We can't take credit for that gift. Um, And we have received that so we can be back in a partnership with God to bring his kingdom to earth. And... Um, that means God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to others. So if you're a follower of Jesus, we can and we should praise God that he's blessed us and that we've received his blessing no matter what our life looks like or whether we know all the right things, believe all the right things, say all the right things all the time. We've received God's blessing. But we must never allow our blessing to become about boasting in ourselves. Like, you're not a Christian and your friends aren't a Christian because you're smarter than them. You're not, you're not a Christian and your friends aren't a Christian because you're a better person than them. Like, there's no room for boasting. You're not privileged any more than the other person apart from the grace and the gift of God. And we need to be humbled by that constantly because that humility is necessary if we are going to do the fruit or the works that flow from true repentance. If we're going to live our lives in a way that reflects Jesus, we need to have that humility um, and not a, not a boastful uh, perspective of privilege. So make this a practice for this week. Seek to bless one other person one time this week. Buy them a coffee, send them an encouraging text, Thank your mom and your dad. Um, Sit with someone at lunch who doesn't have many friends at lunch. Just try to live out this mindset of, I have been blessed. How then can I be a blessing to others right now? That's a mindset we should be living out. 
And the only way we can do it, and the only reason we can do it, is because God has shown that to us when we didn't deserve it. And that's the good news of Jesus. Thank you.